And so today, to show you how the way it works, is I'm basically going to be telling you three separate stories. Because our word and our thoughts are consciousness. And we're always in that flow of deciding how um, things are going to be in our life. So this first story actually happened this morning. So I get up and put on my bathrobe and, and go downstairs because the upstairs toilet is not working right now. Um, go downstairs and the minute I get downstairs and turn on the light, my dog has been sick. So do my business, come out, and then I have to clean up after the dog. <laughs> oh, poor thing. I, my fault. I fed him something last night I shouldn't have. I could tell by what was there. Not pretty. Uh, and then I get ready as, you know, and put my bathrobe back on because I have this routine. I go online and I post on Genesis and I send out a Reverend Gail wake-up call and, and then it's time for my husband to wake up. So I'm, I yell at him across the hall, you awake, time to get up put Gibson outside, make the coffee. So far, so good. So I make the coffee, and for some reason, it hits me that I should let him back in. Normally, I wait for him to bark. I was like, you should probably let him back in. So I open up the screen door. Gibson, no response. Gibson, no response. And I knew he was gone. Now, normally, when I do that, my heart tells me he's just around the corner and I can't see him. So I turn on the back porch light, and sure enough, somebody has been on our backyard last night, opened up the back gate, and the minute I let my dog out, he's a runner. <laughs> he's just gone. So I come in the house. I'm in a panic. Because it's like losing your child. If you have a pet, um, you know. I know Courtney feels the same way about Yoder, and I'm sure some of you have dogs or cats that you feel that way about. I am, I am in a panic, and I run upstairs. Now remember, my husband now is in the shower. And I'm like, Gibson is gone, and I'm throwing sweats on, and Paul's getting out of the shower. And I run outside, and I look up, and I, Gibson, Gibson, and I look down, and I'm yelling. And I walk down to the corner, and I look over, and he's underneath a tree. He's just sitting there. Kind of like, I knew you'd show up and get me, because you always panic. It's the game we play. So I bring him back in the house. And we finish getting ready, and I go upstairs. And yesterday, Courtney and I went out to uh, get me an outfit to go with the shoes. The shoes came first. The outfit came second. So I get, I, you know, I, I get ready, and I go to put the top on, and I put my right arm in the top. And, I, and I've got an issue right now with my right arm, and, and my left arm wouldn't go in the, in the top. And I'm like, my first thought, oh, you've gained a lot of weight. <laughs> what is wrong with you? You need to quit eating all that stuff tried it again, still didn't work. And I take it off to figure out what the heck is wrong, and it's not a shirt, it's a skort. <laughs> For the guys aren't laughing because they have no idea. A skort is a top with shorts built in. So there's legs to this top. It's one piece, hits me about right here. Uh, I'm of an age, that's not something I want to wear. Uh, so I was like, and what happened in that moment was stop. The universe is definitely sending you a message this morning. You need to take a breath. And when my ego overtakes me and I kind of miss out on all the cues, um, I call in Gail Smothers, who was, is my maid, that's my maiden name. And I'm like, all right, Gail Smothers, you need to stop now. Whatever this is, I got it. Everything's going to be fine went to my closet, found a top, and thought, now it's humorous. So I texted Courtney and said, um, I wish you could have been here when I was trying to put my skirt on this morning. So that is, right there, there was a decision point. That's why I tell you the story. There was a decision point along the way, but the big decision point came, are you going to let the rest of your day be chaotic? Because that is how your morning has started. And the only person that get to, gets to choose in that moment is me. I am the only person that gets to say, oh, you need to take a breath. Because if I hadn't taken a breath, trust me, in these shoes, I probably would have fallen and broken my ankle. I am not doing that. Thank you very much. Do you, because the universe was 
really knocking on my door or my ego was it doesn't matter but I have a choice point I have a choice point when my dog goes missing to relax and go he knows his way home because he's done this before and he will end up on the porch I don't know if I'll ever get there because I've, I've had kids and when they disappear it doesn't matter if you know they're going to show up you still go into a panic as a parent but you're always at a choice point and that's the way it works because we are always feeding the universe so the next story is not mine it was actually given to me by Valerie Reeves she's a colleague and she talks about when she was in high school she saw the movie Grease and there was a line in the movie that she absolutely loved and she would repeat it over and over and over again she had an older sister would, who would say things to her like enough already stop with the line from Greece Gl glory you know it's enough I get it you think it's funny she didn't care she was a teenager she just kept repeating it and then she grew out of it and five years later she's working in a restaurant co-owner with her fiance and they have put a very expensive diamond ring on hold at the jeweler and it's her birthday and he decides to surprise her pay off the ring and give it to her on her birthday so she puts it on and the ring of course has not been fitted and she's making everybody in the restaurant all of the employees all of the uh, um, all of the customers look at her ring she is so happy and then they get flooded with customers and she gets busy and she's working and she's making salads and she's filling the salad bar and busy 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 she looks down and her wedding ring is gone and she's in a panic she's hysterical oh where's my ring what has happened and she realizes well you know she has everybody stop what they're doing look for her ring nobody can find it and her fi and she finally remembers her mother saying nothing is lost it is just misplaced and so she goes home and she frets all night long about that she has lost this magnificent ring what's she going to do and the next day they are setting up um, the restaurant and she goes to put out all the salads she takes them out of the containers and dumps them into the bowls and her diamond is in the macaroni salad that's the line from Greece I've lost my diamond in the macaroni salad so when she called her sister to tell her sister she would found her because she didn't remember that was the line when she called her sister to say I found my ring in the macaroni salad she said of course you did that was your favorite line from Greece sometimes we don't want to believe that this is how it works and I am here to tell you it does I would like everybody in here who has an experience like that on how powerful their word is to raise their hand anybody that doesn't have their hand raised I invite you to talk to one of those people because I bet in the conversation they're going to show you how some of your conversations some of the things you think how you show up is creating your reality and I have an opportunity as a minister to listen to people sometimes um, and there are some people who will continue to express their same story and what is really clear to me is that their reality today looks very much like their story because they haven't given it up and it's not easy to do however I invite you if you are in a place in your life where you're looking around thinking how did this happen again or if you're looking at um, this needs to change you have to understand it needs to change with you you cannot wait on the world for the world to change Ernest Holmes didn't say change the world or change your thinking 
Change the world's thinking, change the world's life. He was smarter than that. The words are, change your thinking, change your life. I am living proof of that. And I know other people in this room are living proof of that. Now, I am not saying that we don't go through grief, we don't go through pain, we don't go through life's little bumps in the road. The difference between me now and me then is Gail Smothers, when this would have started to happen in her life, she would have built a house there. It would have been today, probably would have continued till tomorrow, might have gone on to the next week. Depending on my state of mind, I could have hung on to that for a month. And chaos would have ruled my world months, probably years. The difference now is that I am wise enough to go, take a breath. Take a breath. The only person that can stop this chaos is you. Take a breath and decide to be different in the moment. Make this funny because anybody on the outside looking in, watching you put that skirt on, was going to have a real laugh, a belly laugh. Courtney laughed through a text message because she's got a great imagination. So each one of us has an opportunity in our life to be different. And each one of us has an opportunity in our life when we choose to be different not to go to, well, you know, I'm this age now, so if it hasn't happened, it's never going to happen. And so it is. And so it is. Do you know that there are people right now in college that are in their 70s and 80s? Nobody has ever said to them, don't you think you're a little bit too old to get a degree? And if they have, the person's not listening. When I was in ministerial school, I questioned, you know, wow, you're, you're getting started a little bit later in life. What are you doing? And then I was fortunate enough that uh, when I switched campuses from Seattle to San Diego, I walked in and there was an 85-year-old woman there getting her master's degree to become a minister. And I was like, look at her. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome when we see it in other people. The thing is, we don't think we can be those people, most of us. Right? Or am I speaking to myself? Do you ever limit yourself? So here's the thing about the I am. Remember, we started with Susan this morning talking about to embrace the I am. The I am is that realization that I am God in form. And I talked about this last week. I am God in form. There is nothing that I can't do. Now, I can't do surgery, okay? I get that. However, on the realm of infinite possibilities, there's a lot I can do where I can choose to limit myself for whatever reasons. When I got the call to show up at a center for spiritual, spiritual living, I could have chose to sleep in that day. I could have thought, you know, I don't care. Maybe, you know, maybe, and I'm not going there because that just sounds morbid, but, you know, maybe the voice I heard was just a joke. Maybe I should just continue my life on the path I'm on. Screw it. You know, I'm not really hurting anybody except myself, my soul. I didn't know what that was, so what difference does it make? The way it works is it makes a heck of a lot of difference on how you think and perceive yourself. More so than how I or anybody else in this room sees you or thinks about you. Don't take that on. Do not take that on. Because people in their kind-heartedness want to tell you different things about, yourself, about you. And what you have to remember is whatever they're telling you it's a projection of who they are. It's not about you. You've just decided that you're going to receive that. And so remember I've talked about before when somebody says something unkind, 
one of the things you can do instead of responding, and this is a real practice with me, because I always believe I have to defend myself. If you're going to say something about my hair or my shoes or, or the way I talk, I always feel like I have to have a response and defend myself. And the biggest gift I give myself and the other person is to look at them and smile and not say a word. Because the truth is, the minute I don't respond verbally, that gift of their brilliance about me <laughs> stays with them. And truly, that's where it belongs. It's their gift, it's their opinion. How many people in here have a nose? Everybody? You all have as many opinions? Well, you probably have more opinions, but we've all got noses, we've all got opinions. They're opinions, they're not fact. That's all they are. And we get caught up in somebody saying something to us and then making it our reality. Susan this morning talked about a course of miracles in and I don't know if, the, if any of you have noticed on Facebook that I am um, doing A Course of Miracles. For the first time, I think the first time I was introduced to A Course of Miracles was 10 years ago. And here's how my brain operates. It's 365 days, so you start the Course of Miracles on January 1st. This is my rule. There is nothing that says you have to start it on January 1st. However, there's 365 days in the year. There's 365 practices. Of course, you start it on January 1st. So for the last 10 years, January 1st would come and go, and Gail hadn't done the Course of Miracles. So, oh, maybe next year. And this year, because I was already committed to doing posting 100 live videos on Facebook, this year I decided on January 1st you're going to switch from whatever you were talking about, and you're going to do the Course of Miracles. And the first day I did it, because I knew it was my time to do it, I wasn't even at home. I was in Whistler. And I haven't missed a day. And the brilliance of the Course of Miracles is the way it works. The way it works is what it is teaching every single day. How we are so caught up in the illusion of our thoughts, how we are so caught up in what we see as reality, how we are so caught up in other people's opinions and what the news says. If you remember that line in the song, I wanted to remember it and now I don't remember the last half, but you know, she sang it about the TV. We get so caught up in the TV, this little box telling us what we're supposed to believe, what we're supposed to know about the world. And yet, even on the news, it's just their opinion. Not supposed to be. However, it is opinion. They take a factual event, and then they throw a whole lot of stuff around it. And so, the way it works is to really get comfortable in the fact that you're God in form. Every single one of you sitting here God in form. Getting comfortable with that. And what I mean by that is then you need to start re taking responsibility for everything that's happening in your life. Everything. And that's scary. And sometimes even, even though I believe it, sometimes I want to sidestep it. Like, oh, you know, that's, that can't be because... I didn't draw that into my life. And yet every single thing, if I really am honest with myself, if I can sit down, my, my mother used to call them conversations with Gert because that was her first name. If I can really sit down and have a conversation with Gail, take away all the BS, just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with myself, just my side of the street, doesn't matter doesn't matter what that other person did say, whatever, my side of the street. What does that have to do with me? And it might not be what they said, it might be how did it make me feel? Because remember, your feelings are yours. 
It doesn't matter what I say to you, no matter how rude it is, no matter how outrageous it is, you in that moment get to decide. <clears throat> You've got to be kidding, Gail. Of course you don't believe that about me. Or stab in the heart. You're the only person that gets to decide that. So the, the opportunity with this, this philosophy is no blaming, no shaming, just responsibility. I don't blame others. I don't shame myself. I just take responsibility. And when you take responsibility, you have an opportunity then, change my thinking, change my life. This doesn't work for me. What am I going to do different? How am I going to show up differently? So the last story is about Valerie's, Reverend uh, Valerie's sister. She had a mantra that she did all the time. I never get traffic tickets. I never get traffic tickets. Never get a speeding ticket. Never, never, never. She started dating a man who always got speeding tickets. And that was his mantra. Oh, I always get a speeding ticket. I always get a ticket. So they decided to go from California to Nebraska, back where they were uh, both born and raised to see their family. And she's driving through Wyoming, and she was speeding. And all of a sudden, the lights are going off in the back of her car. You know, she can see the lights and hear the sound. And the boyfriend was, had been sleeping in the back seat. And he wakes up, and he goes, you're going to get a ticket. And she goes, I don't get tickets. So the officer walks up to the window and, and he's talking to her and she explains to him, you know, I'm in Wyoming, I'm headed to Nebraska, I haven't seen my family in a long time, I got a little bit excited, my foot got a little heavy, I promise you I won't do it again. And he goes, no problem, I'm not going to give you a ticket, I trust what you say. And then he looked past her to the gentleman in the back seat and said, however, I'm giving you a ticket because you don't have your seatbelt on. The power of your word is amazing. I, I really don't know how often I can say that to you, to remember what you think about yourself, what you think about others, what you say out loud creates your reality. And I've gifted you this before, and I invite you to do it again. Because I won't do it to you because there were times that I really um, wanted to hurt Reverend Susie. When I came in to, uh, to uh, religious science church, that's what we were called then, and evidently the way I talked about myself was not life-affirming at all. And it was so part of who I was, I didn't even know I was doing it. I couldn't even hear myself. And so Reverend Susie, all she would say is, and so it is. Every time I said something that was unflattering about myself, and so it is. I want to be that voice in your head. Every time you start to go to worry, I want you to hear my voice say to you, and so it is. Every time you start to think you're not good enough, you're not worthy. I want you to hear my voice in your head say, and so it is, as a reminder that it's not truth and that you have that opportunity. The minute you hear my voice in your head, you have that opportunity to hit a cancel button. Oh, that didn't hurt. To hit a cancel button and say, wait a minute, I'm going to have a better thought about myself right here and right now. I'm going to change my script. Is there anybody in here so young that they don't remember albums? 33s. Everybody knows what an album is. This was what I was taught. We've got a groove about ourselves, what we tell ourselves. Remember when you would let uh, you'd play an album so often, mine was Black and, uh, Black, and Black by ACDC, that it would get to that point and the needle would just stick. Can you imagine ACDC sticking? But it would stick. And then to get it unstuck, you'd have to pick up the needle and move it over. The lesson I learned is those thoughts that you have about yourself 
are just old patterns in your life that are running you that you may or may not be aware of. You are stuck in a groove. Pick the needle up, move it over, create a new groove. Create a new way of being in the world because in the world will respond to you differently. That is the way it works. Any questions? Don't forget to hear my voice in your head. Spooky, I know. <laughs> Let's pray. And so we sit in this time, in this space, in this moment, Mother, Father, God, Spirit, standing here in the mind of the divine. Every single one of us is in that container. There is no place to go. There is nothing we can do to separate ourselves from it except to feel separate. It is always there. It is always available. It is the truth of our existence. And it is power. And it works its way in and through and as us always, for we are it in form. And so knowing that right here and right now, that each one of us is that presence, that power, that oneness in form. I know right here and right now we claim the good that is God as the truth of who we are. We lay down all of the excuses that we have ever come up with, have ever thought about ourselves, all of the negativity. We just lay it down, put it to rest, step over it, if you will, and create a new groove. I am. I am love. I am compassion. I am worthy. I am abundance. I am beautiful. I am. Each and every one of you claim the I am as your truth. And when you slip and you hear my voice in your head saying, and so it is, you hit that big uh, do-over button in the sky and create a new thought, create a new groove, create a new way of being the truth of who you've come here to be powerful beyond measure magnificent by design the presence of God is within you I invite you not to waste that presence a moment longer be that truth hold that space within your heart know it as I know it for you and as every practitioner sees it of you the oneness that is true. I say thank you. Thank you for this time, for this space, for this knowing deep within my soul, the connection of all of us, the connection to the one, the power, the magnificence of who we are. I call it good because I know it is divinely ordered right here and right now as I turn all of these words over into that powerful presence. I let go, I let God, and together with power and abundance we say, and so it is, amen.